Lily, I'm telling you to stop messing with my son's head, shouted a woman in her sixties in the small kitchen. It seemed that her scream could be heard in the whole Khrushchevka. I'm not messing with him. It is his choice. Your son is a grown man, and he better know who to commit his life to. Remember, child, the woman shifted from shouting to whispering and leaned closer to Lily. Tin would never tie his life down with someone like you. What kind? You name it. With a poor, whispered woman, a filthy cheater, I am not a deceiver. The girl answered quietly. Anybody else would have either thrown a fit or cried. But Lily remained calm. She was ready for this conversation. For months now she'd been tormented by her mother-in-law, Anne, a bossy lady who loved her son Tim very much. Tim, a humble young man of twenty-eight, had chosen a poor girl from the suburbs of Lily as his bride. Had not informed his mother. Anne learned of Lily's existence by chance when she once again tried to match her son with the neighbor's daughter. The combination neighbor's daughter may incorrectly conjure up associations with village life. In fact, Anne's cottage neighbor was a regional official with whom she had been on a long friendship since her college days. Anne herself was not the last person in the region either. Together with her husband, Oliver, she had founded a not insignificant company and was still actively engaged in business. Oliver was the exact opposite of his wife, a modest entrepreneur who never got involved in his son's personal life. He always quietly went about his business, only occasionally taking an interest in how Tim was doing. The idea of marrying an official's daughter seemed wild to him. He believed that marriages of convenience were a thing of the past. Moreover, in spite of Anne's peculiar character and her ability to make connections with the right people, they did business honestly, and a family alliance with a powerful family would not do any good for business. So Anne's motivation was based solely on her outdated notions of nobility and honorable marriages. But understanding the absurdity of the situation did nothing to help Oliver's influence on his wife. Like Tim, he was in a subordinate position to Anne and almost never argued with her. Friends and relatives at first wondered how such different people could get along together. But apparently, this was their secret to family happiness. Anne's ardent temperament was extinguished by the rational, modest Oliver. She gave their relationship energy, and he recycled it and sent in the right direction. But if the husband was able to find himself with such a wife, their son Tim experienced all kinds of difficulties while he was growing up. Yes, and as it turned out, during a period of quite independent life. The events that took place in Tim's childhood and adolescence are of no interest and will rather cause embarrassment and shame for the overprotective Anne. Tim took after his father in character, and he was sympathetic to his mother's temperament. Moreover, the situation had improved over time. For example, Anne did not refuse her son's idea to move, to live in a rented apartment with her own money. Although she had originally planned for Tim to live in their huge family cottage, which he inherited, upon moving in, Tim was even relieved. Did his mother realize that he had long since become an adult, but one thing made him doubt it. About once a month Anne unobtrusively hinted to Tim about the unmarried neighbor's daughter. Tim would kindly deny it, and say she wasn't his type. In fact, he was in no hurry to have a family. And then one day he met Lily, a girl from a working-class family. Lost her father early. She worked as a consultant in a clothing store that Tim frequented. The store was not in the center of town. It didn't sell high-end items. Tim didn't need that ostentatious glitz. He always wore what he was comfortable with. The cheapness of the clothing store where Lily worked spoke not only of Tim's modesty, but also of the fact that she did not fall in love with it for the money. Employees of the store understood that their customers are mostly not the richest people. So when the communication had just begun, and Lily did not know about Tim's parents, she perceived him as an ordinary modest guy. Only later did Tim tell her that he worked for his parents' big company. Lily was even a little embarrassed at first. But Tim did his best not to show the difference in their financial situation in any way. Their relationship was developing, and the hour of X was getting closer and closer. 
Sooner or later, Tim had to let his mother know that Lily was coming into his life. He tried to put it off as long as possible, but one day he let it slip. That day, Anne tried again to hint to her son about the neighbor's marriage. Tim, please, listen to me again. You're not a little boy anymore. Maybe it's time to think about having a family of your own. Mom, here's the deal. If I'm really not a little boy anymore, can I decide for myself when and with whom it's time for me to start a family? Well, you know how much I worry about you. I don't want you to get taken advantage of by some girl who will see a purse instead of you. I really understand that you want what's best for me, but look at me. Do I have it written on my forehead that I come from a rich family? You have nobility written on your forehead. Son, come on, give up your nobleman ways. I beg you. This is the 21st century, not the 19th. What's this got to do with the 21st century? I just don't want you to have to bite your head off. There's Alice. Isn't that an option? Mom, how many times have we talked about this? She's not my type. How much do you know about your taste? I know. Tim started to get a little annoyed. But then he pulled himself together. How so? Maybe you can tell me you know who your real taste is. You'd be surprised, but I do. Tim wasn't going to tell her about Lily on this particular day. But he figured it was the right time. What? Anne was surprised. Did you find a girlfriend? I did. How long? We've been going out for almost six months. And why didn't you say anything? Aya, I was afraid of your reaction. Well, what can I say? You were right to be scared, weren't you? Who is she? Where's she from? She is. Tim started trying to think of a better description. She works in sales and services, I see. A saleswoman so Anne pretended to feel sick. Mom, what are you doing? Tim ran to get some water and handed the glass to his mother. I don't understand your reaction. Who are her parents? I don't really know. Dad's dead, I think, and Mom works in a factory or something. You know how to surprise me. What difference does it make? Why do you think people who weren't born with a gold spoon in their mouth are second rate? You're probably too young to understand that. And you just can't explain it. You live in your bardic stereotypes. Everybody's laughing at you already. What are you talking about? Tim. I'm a locking stock. Well, Mom. Tim thought he was overreacting. That's not what I meant. I just think it would be better if you reconsidered and accepted Lily. I'm not going to accept anybody. Since you're such an adult, we've got your life to live. You don't even want to meet her. No. And looked her son in the eye, though. You know, it would be better if I could see for myself who you're going to get. That's good. You'll like her. After this conversation, Tim wasn't happy for long. After a while he had a worrying thought. What if Mom had agreed to meet Lily, not because she wanted to make contact? It was to personally persuade Lily to break things off with him. After all, Anne was capable of that. Tim's fears were not in vain. From the first meeting, Anne had tried to show Lily where she belonged. Tim had persistently asked his mother to restrain herself, and in part, she kept her promise. In front of her son, she played the role of the quiet, calm mother of the future mother-in-law. But as soon as Lily and Anne were alone together, a duel would ensue. Usually, this did not happen very often. Usually, the conversation was over the phone. The first time Anne called Lily was the morning after she had first met her. Lily, is that you? Who's calling? You have a bad memory for voices. It's Anne. I'm sorry. I didn't recognize her. There's just a lot of noise outside. But I'll be right home. Tim's home right now, and he's awake. Wait, don't hurry back home. I don't want Tim to find out about this conversation. So Lily instantly tensed up. Listen to me carefully. You're not a bad girl, at first glance. But remember, I'm a predator. I can see right through your intentions, and I sense that you're actually a mercenary simpleton. And I'd hate to see you around my son again. Anne, why would you do that? I really love your son. Come on, come on, tell me your fairy tales. You've got the wrong idea. I'm asking you nicely to leave my son alone. 
I'm not hitting on him. He and I have feelings for each other. And I'm not going to break up with Tim because of your whims. Oh, is that so? Well, I'll make it fun for you. What do you mean? You'll find out. And don't let Tim find out about this conversation. Then Lily, of course, was beside herself. She wanted to cry, but she couldn't. Because then Tim would get suspicious and end up fighting with her mother. And Lily didn't want to put a damper on Tim and Anne's relationship. So they lived like this for a few months. Once every two weeks, Anne pestered Lily with her talk and threats. But I have to say, it never got beyond threats. Lily wondered what Anne could theoretically do to break up with Tim. Start a rumor about a lover. Someone would set her up. To be on the safe side, Lily was more careful, avoiding casual acquaintances. She closed all her social networking pages. With the siege on, Lily's nervous system had become considerably more frayed. But, apparently, it paid off. In their relationship with Tim, they had absolute harmony. And she never waited for any action from Anne. Sometimes Lily wondered if Tim suspected something. You couldn't be so naive as not to see the maximum heat in the relationship between the girl she loved and her mother. But Tim was not only modest, he was an impossibly simple man. It was easy enough to pretend that everything was okay with him. He believed it. Well, or just really wanted to believe it. Lily decided that such naivety would do her good. Her plan was just to hold out until the wedding. And then, Anne would simply have no choice but to put up with it. And everything went according to her plan. The calls from her potential mother-in-law were much less frequent, and their tone was no longer so emphatic. Finally, Tim proposed to Lily. Everything happened in the classic banal way. Restaurant. Champagne. Ring. Lily was perfectly happy. She thought she'd won it all. But it wasn't to be. The proposal was a wake-up call for Anne. Apparently, the woman decided she had no chance of ending the relationship, and she went to all the trouble. Anne personally went to her son's rented apartment, where Tim and Lily lived. She waited until her son was at work to be alone with Lily. That night, the conversation took place, in which Anne called Lily a fraud. You are a fraud. You've been leading Maeve Tim around by the nose. What makes you think you got what you wanted? There's not going to be a wedding. You can't stop Tim and I from being happy, Anne. You won't. Anne just grinned back. She was about to leave when the door opened, and Tim walked in. Oh, Mum, hello. What are you doing here? I just came by to check on the newlyweds-to-be. Anne's acting skills were fine. She went from being a migraine to a caring mother-in-law without blinking an eye. That's good. A naive Tim rejoiced, unsuspecting. Tim, listen. Lily began to speak. I want to tell you something. That's right, son. Lily and I have been thinking about the best way to do the wedding. Anne interrupted her. She realized her potential daughter-in-law was about to snap and tell Tim about her problem. So, what did you have in mind? Tim asked. No, I wanted to talk about something else. Lily continued. I think it would be better to cancel the wedding altogether. There was an oppressive silence. Anne was as surprised by Lily's statement as Tim was. She really thought that Lily was going to start complaining about her. But apparently she had managed to get her rival to do it after all. What? Tim interjected. Did I hear something? No, you didn't. I don't think I'm ready to get married yet. Mom, did you say something to her? Tim asked angrily. No, did you? What does that have to do with me? Anne's head twisted in a negative way, pretending not to understand. Then Lily, would you please explain yourself? What's going on? I've decided we're very different people. I have no place in your circle. What circle? Tim was puzzled. You can feel his mother's influence, after all. Look, there is no circle of mine. There's only one circle for you and me. We both fit into it perfectly. No, no, please let me go. At least I need a break. Lily quickly packed her things and left. She ran down the wet sidewalks that hadn't had time to dry from the recent rain. Yes, what Lily had been dreading for the past few months had happened. 
the breakdown. A violent, hysterical, and uncompromising breakdown. For too long she had tolerated it, feared it, kept it to herself. Just before she left, she wondered if she should say it all to Anne's face, right in front of Tim. But then it would be a cruel blow to Tim in the first place. Lily decided not to upset the strong family. If anything, Tim would find many more interesting girls. He would certainly not be alone. But she wasn't ready to endure Anne's lifelong attacks. She realized that marriage is not a panacea, and a stamp in the passport may not have any effect on the behavior of her mother-in-law. That's why Lily decided to take such a desperate step. It took her twenty minutes to run to her apartment, enter it, and lie down on the couch, face down on a pillow. Her mother was away in the country during the summer months, so the apartment was empty. Lily lay on the couch, thinking of nothing. She couldn't even cry for tears, no strength left. After lying like that for a while, Lily got up, took a sedative, and went outside again. She couldn't just lie idle either. Lily was in that state where she didn't know what you wanted. But it was still necessary to be active in some way. It was in that state that people did stupid things, sometimes the most irreparable. Who knows how that day would have ended for Lily if a black SUV hadn't honked its horn as she exited the driveway. She turned around, looked at the driver, then at the license plate, and sighed in relief. It was the car of Tim's father, Oliver. Lily took her time getting into the front seat. Hello, Oliver, she said quietly. Lily had only seen Tim's father twice in her life. He had never come to see them himself. And when Tim invited Lily to their family cottage, Oliver usually worked. Well, hello, Lily. Why are you like this? He said politely and drove ahead. Where are we going? Your place. Frightened, Lily asked. No, are you kidding? I'm not sending you there. It's a nice place. I think we have a lot to talk about. Okay, Lily thought it was Tim who had asked her father to talk to her and bring her back to him. At first she feared that Oliver wouldn't think of anything better than to just take her to their house, where the scandals with Anne would start up again. But as it turned out, Tim's dad decided to do something subtler. He took her to a little cafe downtown. Lily and Oliver chose a table and ordered. I really love this place. Oliver started a conversation while waiting to order. It's not Anne's style at all. We usually prefer a little different kind of place. But you know what I mean. This is where I come when I want to be alone or talk to someone about personal things. It's a nice, uninviting atmosphere. Yes, it's very cozy, Lily answered and looked around. You probably think it was Tim who asked me to talk to you. Oliver cut to the chase. No, this is my own improvisation. I just called Anne an hour ago on a business matter, and she got excited and told me about your running away. And then I realized I couldn't sit in the shadows anymore. You know, I always thought that adults were capable of figuring out their own relationships. You think so too, don't you? I do, Anne. Yeah, that's right. I didn't let Lily Oliver finish. But when another powerful person interferes in a relationship of adults, and moreover, destroys that relationship, you'd need the intervention of a third person who will balance the situation. So I decided to be that third person for a while. Thank you. There's nothing else to be thankful for. I really want you to go back to Tim. Is that what you want? I don't want Tim's relationship with his mom to go bad. It's not that important right now. The ant thing aside, would you agree to go back to Tim? Of course I would. That's a good answer. Now let's think about what's stopping you from doing that. More precisely, who's stopping you from doing it? Of course, you don't like hearing everything Ann says to you. I understand that very well, but understand, treat her with detachment. She won't do you any harm in terms of actual action, and in time she'll get used to it, and then she'll fall in love with you. I know her psychology well. I, too, thought at first that Anne would temper her ardor. For a moment I even thought that was what was happening. But as soon as Tim asked me to marry him, it all started again. Think of it as a final battle. She decided to concentrate all her resources and pour the maximum out on you. After the wedding, 
she'll calm down. In fact, I'm pretty sure she'll change her mind about you a lot sooner. I don't even know. But right now she's glad I left. And imagine me coming back. What kind of reaction would she have? I mean, she could do anything. I'm well aware of your concerns. So here's what we're gonna do. I'll have a serious talk with her. I'll try to calm her down. And I'll intervene every time she starts to piss you off. Just text me, that's all. I'll call her right away. All right. I'm the one who has to bother you every time. Don't worry about that. I'm interested in handling the situation myself. Besides, Oliver leaned over to Lily and started whispering. I never like those neighbors and their golden daughter. And if you do, of course I'll let you know. Lily grinned. She was well aware of Anne's intentions to marry Tim off to the neighbor's daughter. But let's wait at least 24 hours, and I'll call Tim tomorrow. Okay, it's a deal. Oliver asked for the bill and paid it. Okay, Lily, do I have to give you a ride somewhere? Go ahead, go ahead. I'll sit here for a while. Oliver said goodbye to Lily and left the cafe. Lily was left alone with her unfinished tea. At last, after the last day, she had some hope. Was there even one sane person in Tim's family who understood how to solve her problem? No, Lily thought Tim was normal too. He was just too indecisive and naive. And she wanted to keep him out of conflict with his mother as much as possible. And Oliver had offered to help himself, so Ledley shouldn't have worried about his relationship with his wife. If he was the first to go to the meeting, then he knew what he was doing. Lily's musings were interrupted by a tense conversation at the next table. There was a customer and a waiter arguing. Sorry, but your card is not suitable. Kindly but strictly said the waiter. How not suitable? Try again. Frightened the customer replied. I tried three times does not fit. So you have a machine doesn't work. The machine is fine. The other cards are accepted. But wait, what should I do then? I don't have any cash. Try a wire transfer. If I could, I would have suggested it myself. I don't have internet on my phone either. You're putting me in an impossible position. I'm sorry, but in such cases we have to call the police. What and for these pennies the police? Are you kidding me? Absolutely not. Those are the rules. Well, why don't I leave you my passport as collateral or my phone? I'll go get the cash myself. I'm sorry, but that's not allowed. Lily rarely allowed herself to eavesdrop on people's conversations. But here the scene unfolded too close to her, and willy-nilly she became a listener. Moreover, at one point, arguing with the waiter, the customer's voice seemed very familiar to her, or rather, not the voice, but the intonation was so slightly theatrical with a howl. Lily tried to remember where she might have heard those intonations, but it was impossible to remember anything. Then she yielded to curiosity and turned around to face the conflicted table. One glance at the customer was enough. The card wasn't working for her classmate Alex. Lily didn't wait for the waiter to start calling the police. She got up and walked over to a nearby table. Wait, don't call the police. Quietly she told the waiter, I'm paying for the young man's order. What? Alex didn't immediately realize what was even going on. He frantically searched for numbers in the phone book, choosing who to ask to bring the money. And he didn't even notice his classmate coming up to the table. Then Alex did look up and saw Lily. Lily, where did you come from? I just happened to be here. Lily smiled back and put her card on the machine. The classmates decided to quickly leave this unfortunate cafe. Look, I don't even know how to thank you, Alex said, walking down the sidewalk with Lily. Come on, we're not strangers after all. You'd better tell me how you live. Boring, I live. I work as a junior engineer at our chemistry department. What about you? I didn't go far either. I sell clothes. You see how much hope they had for us at school. You can't tell who you can and can't get your hopes up at school. It's all nonsense. And you and I didn't shine. Let's face it. Well, academically, that's a good point. Alex grinned. 
Not a lot of people paid attention to us in the curriculum, unlike the other one. Alex immediately understood the point of Lily's clarification. The fact is that Alex for Lily and Lily for Alex 15 years ago were the first high school sweethearts. The whole class watched their relationship develop, but developed. Too loud a word. From the outside, it seemed more like this relationship was standing still and going nowhere. Alex and Lily knew how each other felt, but they barely did anything about it. They were too timid. No matter how much their classmates tried to push them toward each other, they didn't. The relationship was in limbo for a whole year until Lily changed schools for family reasons. After that, she and Alex only sought each other a few times at reunions. And Alex even tried to have some sort of communication with Lily, but it went nowhere either. On a personal level, of course, we shined in our indecision. The whole class laughed at us. Not laughed at, but jealous, corrected former classmate Alex. Oh, of course I was jealous, but I think I've changed over this time. I've become much more determined with girls. And how are you getting on? Getting married? No, just training so far. But I mean, just a very quick relationship so far. You haven't gotten married either. Not yet, but hopefully there will be a wedding very soon. Until a few hours ago, I doubted it. But things seem to be getting better now. So you're a wife in five minutes. Alex said a little disappointed and looked at Lily. She remembered that look from high school. It seemed to her as if those 15 years hadn't even existed for Alex. It was still the same eighth grade. He still had feelings for Lily. And she told him she was getting married soon. If that were the case, Alex would have the exact same look. Yeah, assuming, of course, everything goes well. Is there any reason to doubt it? Well, there are some circumstances. You don't trust your future husband. No, it has nothing to do with that. Okay, I don't mean to be blunt. I'm sorry, that was an unnecessary question. Can I have your number? Do you think that's a good idea? Lily asked incredulously. No, no, you must have misunderstood me. I'd like to wire you the money for the cafe. You paid for me. Oh, forget it. But it would be very inconvenient for me. Okay, I'll let you know. Lily gave Alex her number. They said their goodbyes and went their separate ways. Lily went back to her house. She didn't dare go back to Tim's place just yet. Why did she need the extra 24 hours to think about it? She didn't understand it but something was keeping her from returning soon. Perhaps it was the deep trauma Anne was systematically inflicting. If separately the outbursts of a potential mother-in-law could be tolerated and forgotten, they all piled up into one big psychological trauma. Tonight's quarrel was the final straw, so she needed at least a night's sleep alone to recover from the incident. The only thing that surprised her a little was the silent phone. After all, Lily had thought Tim would start calling her right after she escaped. But he didn't. Even on Messenger, there were no messages from Tim. Despite the complexity of the situation, his natural modesty found a way to show itself. However, Lily was able to find an excuse for this Timino inaction as well. She decided that at first Tim just didn't want to get under Lily's hot hand and thought it was better to wait until she cooled down a bit and then he just got a call from Oliver, informed of Lily's decision to come back tomorrow. And he asked her not to be disturbed for 24 hours. With those thoughts in mind, Lily calmed down and finally solidified her decision to return tomorrow. Everything had worked out just as Lily had intended, even a little better. The next morning, Tim called her himself, apologized for the past incident, and asked her to come back. Lily immediately did so. Throughout all the wedding preparations, fortunately for Lily Ann, she did not make herself known at all. They occasionally called Tim, but they didn't seem to mention Lily even in those private conversations. Apparently, Oliver managed to do some serious work with her. Lily was quietly happy about that, and she was busy with the wedding. She even felt uncomfortable remembering that not long ago, she might have deprived herself of such happiness by simply running away from Tim. It was good that the wise Oliver had arrived in time. 
No one knows how it would have ended if Tim, with his usual calm and judicious nature, had not taken up the matter. The wedding was one day away, Lily's most nerve-wracking moment of preparation. The phone rang, and she did not immediately pick it up. The problems associated with the ill-fitting dress seemed much more important to her. But soon the phone rang again, and she went to it after all. On the screen, in big letters, Anne popped up. Lily sighed heavily and took the call. Hello, Lily. Hello, asked Anne in a voice not her usual. Normally even her greeting words came out in a particularly unpleasant tone. But this time her tone was calm, even timid. Yes, Anne. Hello. I'd like to talk to you. Please don't be frightened. It's not at all what you think. Anne could feel Lily's first reaction to hers. I'd like to talk. All the previous conversations flashed before Lily's eyes, and for a moment she had time to think that it would start all over again. But if it wasn't going to be like always. No, no, I said it wasn't what you thought. I promise I won't say a bad word to you. I just really want to talk. I think it's better to do it before the wedding. If that's what you think, where do you want to meet? Or maybe we could do it over the phone. It wouldn't be over the phone. I'd like to meet at a coffee shop downtown. It's called Lavender. I'll call you a cab. You don't have to. I know where you don't need a cab. I'll be there in an hour. I'll be there in an hour. Then I'll be waiting in an hour. Lily was extremely surprised. It was the first time she had ever heard Anne's calm voice, and where had she been summoned to? To the same place where Oliver had brought her back to normal before. Coincidences like that happen. After all, they usually spend their family dinners in nice fancy restaurants. And for moments of solitude, they chose the same humble establishment. I wonder if they knew it themselves. An hour later Lily was there. Anne was running a little late. Lily chose the same table she and Oliver had sat at, and she waited. Just five minutes later, Anne walked in. Lily, did you choose my favorite table? She said cheerfully and sat down opposite. You must be here, with Oliver usually resting. Lily asked, as if she wanted to check her hunch. No, why? We usually vacation somewhere else. You know, the nicer ones, you know. I like hanging out here by myself, and I don't think he knows that. Wow, Lily said in amazement. She didn't know what surprised her the most. For one thing, it was strange to her to hear that Anne preferred a private place for privacy. It had always seemed to Lily that Anne was the chief ambassador of local and not so pathos. And here, speaking of more respectable places, she made a face as if she was fed up with all those expensive restaurants and all she could think of was how to escape from them to some humble diner. On the other hand, the coincidence with Oliver seemed even more surprising to Lily. She had an idea that it was her husband who had told Anne where they had talked, and that was the reason for the choice of the place for tonight's meeting. But as it turned out, it really was a coincidence. Apparently, the years we've lived together have some effect on our taste and preference for things that aren't obvious. You're probably a little surprised, aren't you? It was like Anne was reading Lily's mind. I'm sure you thought I was a pretentious aunt who cared more about the price tag than anything else in this world. But no, sometimes I want to be modest. You see, lately I've been thinking more and more about how bored I am with everything. Years ago, I had this image of myself as a rich diva. In fact, she never was. Still understand, a girl from a poor family from the provinces suddenly gets into the circle of the golden youth. Talking about good souls and a trip to Paris will blow anyone's mind. Well, and as a result will be a bouquet of complexes in addition. Oliver has always been sympathetic to this, only occasionally expressing his dislike for what is happening. Although he is just that much more than I should like the whole manner, wearing pants. He's from this, from the golden youth, and I thought that since I became his wife, then, then, must conform to it. The clothes, the house, the restaurants. Over time, I accustomed myself to everything. But if it was only in material terms, no, I wanted my loved ones to match too. And, of course, my most important loved one, Tim. 
I felt it was my duty to find him the best of this life. And what is the best? In my warped picture of the world. Of course, the richest and most expensive. And then the neighbor's daughter grew up. But everything just worked out perfectly. Only thing is, Tim takes after his father. I'm such an idiot. I should have been like Oliver. But no, I'm all about the pathos. Come on, why would you do that? Lily felt sorry for Anne. She never thought she could feel pity for that man. But as soon as Anne was a little frank, everything changed. No, no, don't pity me. You have every right to hate me. I just want you to understand the nature of my initial attitude towards you. All those complexes and rich prejudices were strongly repulsive. When Tim told me about you, because all my ideas about the right life collapsed in an instant. The deep complexes that prevented me from accepting you turned into outright boorishness. Although, in fact, I was in the same position as you years ago. Or maybe Anne wondered, what is it? Are you all right? Lily was frantic. Yeah, I was just wondering if maybe I was trying to save you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What do you mean? Well, I just didn't want you to repeat my mistakes. On a subconscious level, you have all the same possibilities of grabbing those same complexes and becoming a petty woman like me. Though what am I looking for an excuse? You are completely different. And you will never, thankfully, become like me. No, you're absolutely right. I too have experienced and continue to experience discomfort with wealth. And maybe if you hadn't chosen to tell your story, it would have happened all over again. It's good that you understand that. I don't know if you'll forgive me for all the tough talk we've had. I don't think I'd forgive myself. In fact, if I were you, I'd run away right away or give Tim an ultimatum. It was either me or your mother. I had that thought, lightly grinned. But I thought it was too harsh. By the way about you and my shoes. How did Oliver's mother receive you? Oh, Anne turned to the window and stared at it silently for about fifteen seconds. Let's just say it wasn't the best experience I can give you. Oliver's mom was, like me, a bossy woman. Only unlike me, she was rich all her life. I don't know how they managed to make a good fortune in Soviet times. Oliver's dad was a prominent party official, but that wasn't a guarantee of success back then. Anyway, it doesn't matter how. But Oliver's parents lived much richer than the average Soviet citizen. This really surprised me. I walked around their apartment and the dacha with my mouth open, imagining how I would get foreign clothes, real French perfume. That's something you probably can't understand now. The shelves have everything from any country you want. It's all there, but not everyone can buy it, corrected Lilianne. And the quality isn't always original. So, of course, there is a choice. But not everyone can take advantage of this choice. Well, you see, there's that vacuum of a rich life again. Apparently, in my world, everyone can buy everything. I guess that's okay. You don't have to know all the realities. You have to. Sometimes, this ignorance can lead to the most unpleasant consequences, like my lashing out at you. Okay, back to your question. As you may have guessed by now, Oliver's mom didn't accept me either. Only she never said it openly. Then how did you know she didn't accept you? You know, there are times when you walk into a house and you just feel in your gut that you're hated. People don't have to express their hatred, just looks, intonation, that kind of thing. Besides, Oliver stopped calling me to his place at one point. He tried to make sure that his mother and I never crossed paths and his parents didn't even come to my wedding with Oliver. Oliver said they had some very important things to do, but I knew right away. They never accepted me into their family. Oliver's mom passed away quite early in life, and we never had a chance to explain ourselves to her. On the other hand, you didn't fight with her. Lily tried to put Anne's mind at ease. Yeah, she never once raised her voice to me, but you know, Sometimes it's better to have all your emotions expressed to your face than to have them stored away somewhere deep inside. I think her early departure might have something to do with the fact that she kept it to herself all the time. Never let her emotions out. Although who knows, maybe I made it all up for myself. 
Are you blaming yourself for your mother-in-law's early death? No, I don't blame myself directly, but I think I caused her a lot of grief. Most importantly, a lot of hidden feelings. She just loved Oliver very much, so she didn't want to talk about it openly. And I must have been a bad mother to act so rudely. In the end, it turns out you made the right choice. We were able to have a human conversation after all. Explaining yourself is better than keeping it to yourself. You did the right thing compared to Oliver's mother. But what could I have driven you to? But it's okay. You didn't drag me to anything. I'm not the weakest character either, you know. I've been hurt, of course, by your quits. Well, I put up with it, except for the last time. Well, you did it wrong. You should have acted on it. Told Tim and Oliver everything. I told you I didn't want to upset your relationship with Tim, so I kept quiet. And about Oliver, I hardly knew him at all. Until that unexpected conversation. As it turns out, I hardly knew him either. No, I mean I knew he was a good psychologist, but to be that understanding, he built a strong business from the ground up. I participated in it, of course, but more as a performer just doing what he told me. From scratch. I thought you said that Oliver was from the Golden Youth. Yes, he was. But what kind of business in the Soviet Union? He built his own company. And not like a lot of people bought a factory cheaply and made money off of it. He rented premises, bought equipment all by himself. He may have had an easier time with the initial capital than others, but nobody piled millions on him. His father took the collapse of the Soviet Union hard, so he was skeptical about Oliver's idea to create his own enterprise. Didn't help much, so that's where I'm going with this. Entrepreneurs, businessmen are a special breed. Oh, I've seen a lot of them. Over the years, some of them make me sick. Some are bad, some are good, but they all have something in common. Grip, reaction time, toughness. But when you look at Oliver from the outside, there's none of that. Not even just from the outside. At home, he's a harmless guy who I would never trust to run a big company. I, by the way, am much more of an entrepreneur than he is. Anne smiled, took a sip of coffee, and continued. But no, after all, he raised the company and in the most difficult time for the country, not only raised it, but developed and successfully manages it to this day. How I wonder. How can one be a successful entrepreneur with such a character? I did not immediately begin to think about it. You see, when you live with a person for many years, you'd no longer notice his characteristic features. You perceive everything as normal. But at every meeting with entrepreneurs at every business lunch, I felt some kind of discomfort. I didn't like those rich guys. And my Oliver was always so nice and relaxed. That's when I started noticing that he was different from the usual entrepreneurs. For a while, I forgot all about it. Different and different. What now? That is actually why I married him, and not someone else. But with each new meeting with each new eccentric businessman I met, I wondered again about Oliver's character. And then it finally began to dawn on me. Oliver has some kind of psychological skills that help to solve all business problems. At first it seemed to me that this was only a small part of his company's success. After all, many of the issues related to negotiations were handled by me. But with time I realized that Oliver's silent modest participation was a much bigger part of our success than my loud flashy negotiations. He is like a spider quietly weaving his web, kindly inviting his competitors, partners, and subordinates into this web, enveloping them, and then doing whatever he wants with them. Somehow he manages to find weaknesses, painful points, or just the most important in some matter, Oliver quietly presses on these points, and he gets the result he wants. I thought at the time that he only does that in business. In life, he is quieter than the grass, unpretentious. He does not demand anything. He just do not need to show their psychological skills. But it wasn't like that. It was only in the last month that I realized that he had been using these skills throughout our life together. It's just that Oliver was doing it so filigree that I didn't notice anything. And I guess he was just happy with my hot temper. 
That's why he wasn't actively involved in our relationship. Marriage is not a business. There are other processes at work there. And how did you end up noticing this? What happened in the last month that hadn't happened in your entire life together? You happened. Anne grinned. But Tim and I started our relationship much earlier. Yes, but all the time Oliver didn't interfere. And then he decided to clean up his act. That's when I understood it. Why did Oliver decide to get involved? Oh, I don't know. It's so unlike him. Usually he's separate, and Tim's personal life is separate. I think the answer's pretty straightforward. He just felt sorry for you. Realized you were in pain because of me. He waited and waited, and at the most decisive moment, he stepped in. Okay, what did he do besides talk to me? He had two conversations with me, calmly, without raising his voice. Gently explained everything. After that I completely changed my outlook. I had never worked with a psychologist. But it seems to me that after a long therapy with professional psychologists people experience something similar. He brought me back down to earth and explained how I looked from the outside. And in two conversations Oliver managed to change your personality. As you can see, only it wasn't exactly like that. He didn't change my identity. Oliver helped me shed the tinsel that was hanging over my real identity. Those horrible rich girl complexes, prejudices. The first conversation happened after you ran away. I don't know what it was that clicked, but that evening Oliver sat down with me and told me straight out that he wanted to talk. He told me how he talked to you. What a positive girl you really are. And then he started asking simple leading questions, which made me realize how stupid I was. After that, I decided to give you a break. Not calling, not writing, avoiding meetings. I thought you hated me and wouldn't even agree to a normal, calm conversation. Like we're having right now. And last night we had our second conversation. There he reminded me of our personal history, of my relationship with his mother. Yesterday I finally realized how wrong I was with you. And I decided that we should end this ridiculous feud before the wedding and explain to you as openly as possible what I had realized about myself not so long ago. I hope I had succeeded. And even more, I hope you'll forgive me. Of course, of course I will. You are a very strong man. Only strong people can change so radically in such a short time, and at the same time look in the eyes and apologize. Oh really? Strong people don't take this long to torment their daughters-in-law. You had your reasons for doing it. Well, shall we put it behind us then? Although I really don't want you to repeat my mistakes, the most important thing in any marriage, and even more so when it comes to any financial additions, staying true to yourself. Yeah, thanks for the heads up. I more than understand it. Good for you. Well, I won't keep you any longer. Get ready for tomorrow. Big time, it's coming. Lily said goodbye to Anne and left the cafe. It was going to rain outside again. This summer, the weather was not good for the people of the city. Lily hailed a cab, sat in the back seat, and leaned against the window. The cab driver, seeing the pensive expression on Lily's face, didn't distract her with conversation. He put on some quiet radio station and silently drove Lily home. Lily really had a lot to think about. It seems she should be driving now in bewilderment of the conversation that had taken place. After all, how was it possible that Tim's mother, who had harassed her for more than a year, was not only a subtle and sensitive person, but also found the strength to apologize and explain everything to Lily? But Lily wasn't thinking about the sudden transformation in roles and attitudes toward her mother. She felt like she had just talked to a friend she had known for years. Absolutely the same feeling. She trusted Anne wholeheartedly. She didn't doubt the sincerity of her every word. Everything was so casual, so peaceful, that Lily had forgotten all the hardships this woman had put her through. Someone had reached into Lily's memories with an eraser and erased all the negative content. And now she just drove and enjoyed the moment. She didn't even have to think about tomorrow's wedding to enjoy it. Lily was already happy. I'm sorry. You're so thoughtful. The cab driver couldn't take it anymore and spoke to his passenger after all. 
is something important coming up. Yes, you guessed it. Something important indeed. Well, what can a young beautiful girl have that's important? A wedding? Divorce? Still a wedding. Oh, I'm very perceptive today. The cab driver complimented himself. Are you excited? A little. That's right. It's better to be excited beforehand. So there won't be any problems later. I, for example, was like this. The cab driver began to pour out an incredibly interesting story from his life, which Lily stopped listening on the second sentence. It was not until the end of the story that she came to her senses. The cab driver emotionally warned her to always be on her guard, especially before a wedding. There will always be those who want to upset her. So girl, I hope that you do not repeat my mistakes and do not trust everyone at once. We're here now, by the way. The car actually pulled into the courtyard of the house where Tim and Lily's apartment was located. After paying the driver, Lily went upstairs. Tim wasn't home, so once again she was alone with her thoughts. Lily couldn't remember what the shrewd cab driver had been talking about at all, but his last words had stuck in her head. Maybe she really was in a hurry to trust Anne. What if this was some last-ditch ploy on the part of her future mother-in-law? Or rather, if her plan succeeded, she would never become a mother-in-law. Lily said to herself, Stop. She was even a little frightened by her own thoughts. Why did I get all nervous? Some cabbie said something stupid, and I didn't think twice about it. So I just fell for it. No, you need to calm down and not pay attention to all sorts of insignificant things. It's all nerves, it's all nerves. Lily shamed herself and continued to prepare for the wedding. She needed to plan for tomorrow once more. She and Tim decided to forego the hit-and-run traditions of the type. The groom shouldn't see the bride before the wedding in her dress and other classic superstitions. They decided they would go to the registry office together and then drive modestly to a restaurant to celebrate. Tim and Lily didn't want many guests, just the parents. Lily's mother, a few friends and a few girlfriends. There didn't seem to be any problems with the arrangements. The only thing Lily was worried about was whether she would have time to go to the beauty parlor before the registry office, but there a lot depended on the speed of the master, not on her. The next day Lily went to the salon even earlier than she had planned. She called ahead to see if there was any free time. Lily had been to this salon literally several times in her life. Usually, she decided on her appearance by herself and had her hair and manicure and pedicure done by her own hands. At first, she just didn't have the money for all those masters. And then, even when she and Tim were able to go anywhere, the habit of doing everything herself remained. And it must be said, Lily was pretty good at it, so there was no need for beauty salons. But the wedding was still a special day, and Lily decided to trust the hands of the master. They chose a hairstyle together, and she began to work on Lily's hair. Lily watched the master's hands closely, as if to prepare, if anything, to stop in time. For example, if she wanted to cut too much hair, after a couple of minutes, Lily calmed down a bit, relaxed and stopped this total control. She decided that the master knows his business, and there was no need to constantly glare at her. But it wasn't long before Lily had to tense up again. The phone rang in her pocket. At first she did not want to pick up the phone, not wanting to interrupt the master's process, especially since the ringing was silent. The ringing stopped. Lily had time to exhale. But then the phone rang again. If anything, you can answer it. It won't interfere with our work said kindly the girl foreman, who appeared to have also heard those quiet calls. Okay, answered Lily, taking the phone out of her pocket and taking the call. Hello, speaking. Lily, good afternoon. A gruff, male voice came over the phone, as if it had been specially altered in a computer program. Who is it? Without saying hello, Lily asked. She felt at once that something was wrong. It is, shall we say, a well-wisher. Who? I beg your pardon. A well-wisher. I want you to have a good life. Stop this circus. Identify yourself immediately. Calm down, Lily. There's no need to be angry. 
My job is to help you. So please listen to me and don't hang up on me. It's for your own good. I know what I need to be happy. If you're not going to introduce yourself, I'm hanging up. Have a nice day. Lily thought she was getting a call from a scammer and was about to hang up. Hold on, hold on. It's about your wedding. The man shouted into the receiver and it worked. Lily didn't press the reset button. Okay, so just speak clearly, quickly, and without the idiotic mystery. Okay, I'm going to be as direct as possible. You need to call off the wedding immediately because the man you want to marry is not who he says he is. What the hell are you talking about? Who the hell are you? I can't reveal my identity just yet because that would make it worse for both of us. Tim is a traitor and a traitor. He's been living a double life and lying to you for years. Okay, grunts, stop it right now. On what grounds am I even supposed to believe you? On any basis, I'm telling the truth. And tonight, if you don't call off the wedding, you'll see for yourself. Tim will cheat on you during the reception. Look, it's really not even funny anymore. You could come up with something more believable. All right, fine. You don't have to believe me, but you're going to regret this very much today. Right now, you can still call off the wedding. Right now, you can avoid the embarrassment of tomorrow and the trauma of the rest of your life. Please, trust me on this. How do you even think about this? I have to call off my wedding because some cheater called me and told me some bullshit about my fiancé. Well, it's still your choice. Yeah, it sounds risky, but trust me, it's worth it. I mean, it's gonna be late tonight. Indelible shame. You have a few hours to think about it. I warned you. That's it. I can't hear it anymore. Goodbye. Lily ended the call and tossed the phone in front of the mirror. She looked at the girl master. She calmly continued to work, pretending nothing was going on. But you could see in her eyes that she was a little shocked by what was happening. Lily urgently needed someone to share her impressions of the call with, so she spoke first. I don't understand how this is possible. A stranger calling without introducing himself and trying to ruin my wedding. But what is this? There's no mood left. Don't worry. Master Lily reassured me. The closer any important event, the more unnecessary problems will arise. Maybe it was a secret admirer who called you, who does not want you to get married. Or, for example, an ex-boyfriend takes revenge. What are you saying? Why would I have a secret admirer? In fact, do you know how many years ago my previous relationships ended? I think all the exes have long forgotten me. Could it really be some kind of scammer? Now they're going to call again demanding money to make the wedding a success. Maybe they're crooks. Although I've never heard of such complicated schemes. Do you know what they are now? Okay, we'll see. The master finished his work, and Lily drove home. In the cab, she was still as thoughtful as yesterday. Only this time the cab driver was able to keep silent for the rest of the ride. Lily thought about that mysterious call. She carefully chased one thought away but it came back again and again. It was the thought of Anne's involvement in the call. Wasn't this all part of her big plan? Yesterday to lull the vigilance, to deflect suspicion from herself, today to launch this nonsense. There was no reason for Lily to really suspect Anne. She forced herself to believe that it was just her prejudices and nothing more. For one thing, the scheme is complicated. Anne could have come up with something much simpler and more clumsy. She doesn't need to hire people, break up the comedy in the cafe to give her son an ultimatum or talk tough face to face with Lily. And second of all, Anne was very persuasive yesterday. Lily had worked in sales for a long time, and she knew when a person was pretending and when he really liked this or that thing. Anne was not, of course, a customer of a discounted jacket, but the principle was the same. Yesterday, when she was talking about moments from her youth, about Oliver's mother, she had real tears in her eyes. Yes, she was able to hold them back. But Lily saw those tears. So Anne's version of shenanigans seemed pretty wild to her. The cab driver drove her home quickly. Lily arrived with plenty to spare. Tim had just woken up. He was in a good mood. 
You look gorgeous, he said to Lily, looking at her new hairstyle. Thank you. Tim thanked Bride and hugged him. She hugged him silently for a few minutes. Is everything okay, Lily? Tim inquired, looking at a silent Lily. Yes, yes, everything is fine. She answered him in an unsure tone. Are you worried about the wedding? Tim was not convinced by Lily's words. A little. Probably more than I should be, though. I know. I'm worried, too. Though you and I are advanced people. For us, it's just a few drops of ink in our passports. Why do we have to worry about it? We should just think of the wedding as a celebration. Enjoy it. You make a good point, Lily said inside. What's the matter with you? Tim hugged his bride even harder. Are you sure it's just the wedding you're worried about? Nothing else is wrong. How's mom? Oh, nothing. I had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with her yesterday. She hasn't called again. No, I don't mean mine. I mean yours. How does she make it to the wedding from the village? How's she doing? Mine's doing all right. She wanted to know how you were doing. Unlike Anne, Lily's mother immediately accepted Tim as her own. She had no intention of making any demands on her future son-in-law. She had complete confidence in her daughter's choice. Well, that's good. That means everyone will be here tonight. For the first time in our relationship. Or is that what you're worried about? You could say that. Lily wasn't exactly lying to Tim. She was, of course, more worried about the call, but she hadn't forgotten about her mother's upcoming meeting with Anne, either. There was no telling what it might end up. Her mother was a simple woman who might say something to Anne if she started to show her temper. She could only hope that Anne's transformation from yesterday would spread to the wedding festivities, and everything would go quietly and peacefully. Lily was sure of her mother. She would never provoke a conflict, but she might react. I think everything would be all right. People are adults. They understand. Dad would be there, all the more so if anything happened. He'll keep an eye on everyone. Tim grinned, alluding to his mom's complicated nature. Yeah, that was comforting. Oliver's presence did give Lily the assurance of a quiet evening. The man had recently demonstrated exceptional wisdom and the ability to resolve difficult conflicts. So, if we're going to be okay, why the long, sad look? Tim, Lily looked intently into her fiancé's eyes. Tell me honestly, you're not going to leave me for anyone, are you? What are you doing, Lily? No, I'm not. Tim was a little taken aback by Lily's sudden question. In all the time we've been together, have you ever cheated on me with anyone? I haven't. Look, I'm a little freaked out by your questions. What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. Lily hugged him tightly again. If you're so faithful to me, nothing happened. Nothing's wrong. They sat like that until they left for the registry office. Lily had the thought of telling Tim about the call, but she didn't dare do it. It looked too silly. And not just from the outside. Lily herself thought the situation was as stupid as possible. Telling Tim everything would only spoil his mood. And there had to be at least one person at the wedding who was in a festive mood. Even more so, even if you make the most unrealistic assumption possible and consider that the man who called wasn't lying, and Tim really is the last scoundrel. He himself will never admit it, and will deny everything anyway. So Tim's initiation into the mystery call seemed to Lily, on all sides, to be the wrong decision. She thought the best thing to do now would be to forget about the call. Yes, getting rid of the intrusive thoughts completely was not going to work. One way or another, the subject would come up during her celebrations, but at least it was worth trying. Especially right at the wedding, and get to finally make sure that this call is a fabrication of some scammers. After all, according to their claims, Tim was supposed to cheat at the wedding. That seemed to her the most delusional of all, of all the flow of information from the unknown. At a wedding, the groom is almost always in the public eye. Why would he cheat right there? Even if Tim was a pathological cheater, why wouldn't he wait a little while? And how would the callers know that? Anyway, the more Lily thought about the call, the more she found it absurd and calmed down. 
The long-awaited hour of the trip to the registry office came. There everything went modestly, tastefully, and without incident. Lily and Tim were solemnly pronounced husband and wife, and they were now on their way to celebrate the wedding at a restaurant. The newlyweds did not engage in cheap pathos and order a limousine. Oliver and Anne drove them to the place where they were celebrating. At the restaurant, Lily went out to the ladies' room and along with the already established mother-in-law. Well, Lily, congratulations again. And once again, I apologize to you. You are now officially part of our extended family, Anne said graciously. Thank you. Lily answered graciously too. No need to apologize. This is a new chapter in the history of our relationship, and you know who can remember the old days. Wise beyond her years, Lily. Anne remarked and walked out into the hall. Lily was left with some makeup to fix. During all the activities in the registry office on the way to the restaurant, she never once remembered the mysterious phone call. Now the conversation with Anne reminded Lily of her groundless suspicions toward her mother-in-law. She was now convinced that Anne had nothing to do with it, having finished all her business. Lily, too, entered the hall and took her seat next to her fiancé. The celebration went smoothly. Lily's mother quickly found common ground with Anne, and now they sat together nicely discussing the children. The first hour of the party passed, then the second. The waiters just had time to bring new bottles of wine and stronger drinks. Despite the high degree of merriment, there was no conflict. The news of the wedding reached Lily and Tim's more distant relatives. Surely, because Lily posted a wedding photo in one of the social networks. After that, unexpected calls from various friends of the past began. Third cousins and sisters, Lily and Tim only had time to leave the table outside or just in quiet areas of the restaurant so that they could hear the caller. At some point Lily got tired of it and sat with the phone right at the table, and then Tim got the call again, and he stepped out of the table somewhere. A minute later, the phone rang, and so did Lily. She picked it up, saw another unidentified number, and pressed to accept the call. Hello, Lily. Do you recognize me? What's so hard to hear? Who is this? I called you this morning and warned you about something, said a gruff male voice. Oh, you again. Lily instantly sobered up. What do you want? I don't want anything. I've done what I could. I warned you. You didn't listen. Now all you have to do is reap the benefits of your mistakes. Stop this nonsense. Lily left the table and went to a quieter corner. You can be tracked down by your phone number. Do you even know about it? Yeah. Lily, Lily, you naive girl. And to convince me that I'm not lying, you just need to put your hand in your new husband's jacket pocket. Anyway, as you will find out, please call me at this number. All the best. The man hung up. Lily turned around and slowly walked to the table. Tim still wasn't back. As luck would have it, he'd gone off the phone in his shirt and his jacket was left hanging on the chair. Lily reluctantly sat down in her seat, looked around, and carefully reached into Tim's jacket pocket. There she fumbled for a piece of paper. Lily looked around again and pulled it out. The piece of paper was neatly rolled up several times and smelled like perfume. Lily put her hands under the table and trying to keep a nonchalant expression on her face, unfolded the piece of paper. Then she peered down carefully and tried to read the contents. It turned out to be a note. The author of the note had written only a few words in a good handwriting. Seven o'clock in the small banquet room. Waiting. Lily looked at her watch. It showed five minutes to seven. Lily wasn't quite sure what was going on at all. It looked like some kind of idiotic prank. Maybe someone really was playing a prank on me. Lily calmed herself down. But Tim knows I don't like pranks. Oh, I don't like it. Oh, I don't like it. Lily got up from the table and walked around the room. She knew that this restaurant had two banquet rooms. The note was probably referring to the second small banquet room. Lily was hesitant to head there right away. After all, it was already very much like some kind of joke. Maybe she shouldn't fall for it then. But on the other hand, 
Since someone with a bad sense of humor had decided to make the wedding more fun, why not play along? Tim, for instance. Lily still had hope that she just couldn't find that small banquet hall. But no. Her gaze stopped treacherously, just beside the small banquet hall sign. She glanced again at her watch. It just took her five minutes to think about it. Then Lily gently opened the door and peered inside. The hall was out of order. There were chairs on the tables and decorations lying on the floor. To one of these decorations some girl, most likely a waitress, was passionately clutching Lily's husband. Lily was stunned. That's it. That's enough. Tim spoke softly, barely moving his tongue. Lily watched in silence. Oh, so there you are. Anne's happy voice came over. We've been looking all over the restaurant for you. It's like a wedding without the newlyweds. The woman didn't have time to finish her sentence. She looked into the unhappy rooms, too. Lily turned and quickly ran toward the exit. Anne tried to catch up with her. Tim finally realized he'd been spotted. He jumped up, but only managed to walk a few steps and collapsed. Lily and Anne stopped at the door of the restaurant. Lily, my girl, I beg you, wait. Her mother-in-law urged her, Please don't, I beg you. You were right then, I have no place in your family. Stop it. What are you saying? What am I saying? Why don't you ask your son? What a fool I was. What a fool. How long has he been leading me on? Wait, give me just one minute. I can imagine how you must be feeling right now. But I'm just as confused as you are. I don't think you should jump to conclusions. Anne, I understand you wanting to protect your son, but what conclusions can there be? You saw it yourself, didn't you? I did, but that doesn't sound like my son. Let's do this. You give me an Oliver at least half a day. Now you promise me that you won't do anything stupid for half a day, and you won't run away. Taima, we'll take you back to our place. You've seen the state he's in. Okay, well, what will change in that time? I don't know but we'll at least try to figure it out. What a shame. Don't worry about it. There's no shame yet. Nobody's seen Tim but you and me. I'll go back and tell the guests that the newlyweds are tired of sitting here, and they're going home to celebrate in private. Taima will try to steal away unnoticed. You go on home then. But again, please don't do anything stupid. I'll try, Lily said. She turned around and walked toward the house in her wedding dress. Where on earth did you stop her, Anne? Let me call you a cab. Her mother-in-law called Lily a cab and sent her home. Lily got home in a half-faint state. For her, it was like a bad dream that wouldn't end. She collapsed on the sofa and sighed heavily. Lily stared at the ceiling, tears streaming from her eyes. She hadn't even the strength to change her clothes. She lay there for hours until the doorbell rang. Lily didn't want to go to the door. She didn't want to do anything at all. But the calls didn't stop. And then Lily forced herself to get up and open the door. Anne and Oliver entered the apartment. Lily, is your laptop around? My father-in-law asked without any introductions. It was lying around here somewhere. Lily opened the laptop and handed it to Oliver. It's great. Now you'll see something. The father-in-law inserted a small flash drive into the laptop and turned on the video. It turned out to be security footage of the restaurant. It shows Tim standing and talking on the phone. At some point he gets sick. He is leaning against the wall and tries to make his way to the exit to the street. Then a waitress stops him and asks him to walk with her. She actually drags him to the empty banquet hall and places him on the set. Then the waitress stands at the front door and starts looking somewhere, now into the next room, now into her phone. After reading a message on her phone, she stands by the door for a few minutes and then walks over to Tim. Tim awkwardly tries to push her away and mutters something under his breath. Then the waitress forcefully tries to kiss him. At the same moment, Lily peeks into the hall. So that's what it's all about. Lily says with goggling eyes, I told you we'll figure it out. Anne summed up the video. Wait, so Tim must have been drugged. How's he doing now? We should call the police 
have them run forensics. I don't think we're going to need the police here. Oliver answered her. Tim is crumbling at our house right now. His pulse is fine. His blood pressure's fine, too. We should get some sleep. And I did the examination myself. I just took Tim's glass in my hands. I didn't mistake it for ordinary wine and vodka. How with vodka? Surprised Lily. We didn't even order it. Well, some waiter was careful to pour vodka instead of plain wine for Tim. I looked at your place, it was regular wine. And Tim himself, you know, he's not much of a drinker. Wine and beer he's fine. What's stronger? The body can't take it. Apparently, the organizers of this performance were not aware of Tim's reaction and thought that he would just get tipsy and fall for some girl. But our fighter fell before it is time. Fantastic. Lily couldn't get over the shock. Okay. Do the cameras show who was mixing the wine and vodka? No, they didn't have cameras in the kitchen. There are at the bar, but I couldn't get any footage there. I even barely begged the security guard for it. The same waitress poured the wine into Timmons' glass directly in the hall. So we'll have to talk to the waitress. Lily hissed, we must. It's not quite clear how they calculated that you'd come to the other room at exactly the right time. No, it's pretty clear. Lily told her mother-in-law and father-in-law about the two mysterious phone calls and the note. Look, it's like a movie. Anne wondered. Why didn't you just tell Tim? I didn't think it was that serious. I thought it was just some scam. I didn't want to spoil Tim's mood over nothing. Yes, Anne sighed. I wonder what his reaction will be when he wakes up. I don't think it will be soon. Oliver answered his wife. Knowing some peculiarities of his body, he won't wake up until tomorrow morning. What are we going to do then? Lily asked, confused. Well, here's the deal. I propose to finish what we started. Call your mysterious admirer. Tell him you were wrong. And make sure what a cheater Tim was. Thank him and offer to meet him. Preferably right away. Got it. Lily pulled out her phone and did everything Oliver told her to do. The meeting was set for half an hour later in a nearby square. Anne and Oliver arrived there a little early, pretending to be a couple who decided to take a walk before going to bed. Lily changed her clothes and went to the square too. Two minutes before her appointment time, she saw a male silhouette walking toward her at a brisk pace. The stranger had his cap on low. It was impossible to tell who it was from afar. But Lily, why didn't you want to give me your phone that time? You wouldn't have learned so much. The man said cheerfully and took off his cap. So it's you? Lily exclaimed. Standing in front of her was her former classmate Alex. I can't thank you enough. Really? It was enough to go on a date with me. How did you find out all that information about Tim? Well, connections. Connections with a waitress at the restaurant you work at, who can put vodka in the wine on time. What? Alex didn't get a chance to finish his sentence before he slapped me across the face. You used to be just an undecided jerk, and now you're even meaner and meaner. I didn't expect that. Lily was approached by her father-in-law and mother-in-law. So, is this the show organizer? Oliver asked. I see, I see. But I think he could be prosecuted for slander. What if the actions with the drinks qualify as personal injury? Oh, I'm afraid he won't get away with probation. Lily, I'm sorry. Alex said in a pitiful voice. I just love you all these years. I can't bear to see you. You bastard. Lily turned away and looked at Oliver and Anne. Well, Lily... I think this man's fate is in your hands. Calmly said her mother-in-law. What am I supposed to do with him? Lily sighed and turned to Alex again. So get out of here then. But if I ever see you anywhere again, even accidentally, we will pursue a criminal case. Do you understand? Yes. Alex obediently replied. He turned around and walked quickly toward the exit. Oliver and Annie took Lily to their family cottage. They spent half the night talking in the kitchen and making fun of the day before. As it turned out, the other guests at the wedding guessed nothing and continued to celebrate without the bride and groom. Tim woke up the next day with a terrible hangover and a huge memory lapse 
and he didn't even remember any waitresses. Liley and her mother-in-law and father-in-law decided not to tell them anything. So unusually began a new family page in the life of a modest girl named Liley.